Hi there. So in this video, we're going to go into detail into a gene family called the EGFR family. And this is a very well-studied family um, that uh, can be a little complicated, um, but plays a really important role in cell growth and differentiation and plays a big role in human cancers. So uh, we need to sort of delve into the nitty gritty of this large gene family and the nomenclature and how the proteins work. Um, so let's, let's dive into it. Um, and a previous video covered the concept of gene families and where gene families come from. So we're introducing here the EGFR family. And in a previous video, we talked about EGFR, uh, epidermal growth factor receptor. Right? It is a uh, receptor tyrosine kinase that is found on the surface of most human epithelial cells. And in fact, many human cells in the body have a member of the EGFR family, at least one, if not multiple members of this family expressed. So these uh, receptors play a very important role in signaling a cell to go through the cell cycle. So in previous videos, when we talked about growth factors and growth factor receptors and how they work, we did talk about EGF, epidermal growth factor, um, which is a growth factor that binds to the ligand binding domain of EGFR. And when that occurs, it causes these receptors, which are usually monomers, causes them to dimerize, so they have high affinity for one another. And this binding and this dimerization leads to a structural change in the receptor, and the kinase domain becomes highly active. So those purple domains that I'm drawing in there. When the kinase becomes active, uh, the kinase can phosphorylate its substrate. And so when these receptors dimerize, the tyrosine kinase in one receptor will phosphorylate tyrosines found in the other receptor. So that is known as transphosphorylation, sometimes called auto-transphosphorylation. So again, um, this signaling uh, is very uh, critical for cells when uh, we need more cells. So when we're growing, when we have tissue damage, when uh, old epithelial cells are uh, die or come off uh, any of the structures in our body, any of the tubes where you find epithelial cells lining those tubes, uh, we need more cells. This signaling will help get cells to go through the cell cycle and uh, go through mitosis, make more cells. So it's a very important signaling pathway for, for proliferation of most epithelial cells in the body. And in fact, since most uh, epithelial cells, um, or since most human cancers arise from carcinomas, or arise, no, let me say that again. Most human cancers are carcinomas. Carcinomas are cancers that arise from epithelial tissue. So in fact, the EGFR family uh, plays a very important role in most, but not all, human carcinomas. And so we're going to see that here today. And so this concept we introduced, uh, I introduced in a previous video. Um, all right, so now let's talk about the EGFR family, right? So it's going to get a little more complicated. In the previous slide I showed there, I just showed EGFR and EGF, right? It's a little more complicated than that. So EGFR, right, the receptor, the gene for that protein is found on chromosome 7. And so we call that gene, we can call it EGFR. So the EGFR gene codes for the EGFR protein. And there's a version of that protein that I drew that's right there. That's on chromosome 7. Great. So the first thing I'm going to introduce to you now to make this a little more complicated, um, and I'm not doing it on purpose, I'm just sort of explaining how it is in, uh, in science, is... Um, sometimes in science, things, the same thing has multiple names. And so the reason, why do they have multiple names? So for example, EGFR, it has a different name. It has another name called ERBB. Now, what does that stand for? Doesn't matter. Uh, where did it come from? Scientists, some group of scientists might discover a gene and a protein and characterize it and work on it and study it. And then another group of scientists might be studying a gene and discover a protein and studying it. And each group, when you discover something, you get to name it. So one group names one thing, one group names something else. And then it turns out that, oh, they were both working on the same thing the whole time. But in the literature, uh, scientists have been calling this gene one thing and a bunch of people have been publishing and researching on it. So that name, 
is there. And then in the literature, there's another name for the same gene, but they didn't know it was the same one at the time. Uh, so you have all these other scientists researching and publishing uh, into this other name. And now, once they realized, oh, we're both working on the same thing, you've got literature filled with uh, two different names for the same thing. And so that happens a lot in science. And so what do you do with the names? Well, you have to keep them both because they're both found in the literature. Sometimes some scientists prefer one name over another. Um, but in science, many things are called different names um, because of the way they were discovered. And then they were named, and it turns out that uh, they had already been discovered and named, but now the names all stick. So um, EGFR is also called ERBB. So those two mean exactly the same thing. So I haven't gotten into the family yet. I'm just introducing this concept of uh, sometimes you could have the same gene and have multiple names for it. Or the same thing with the protein. All right, finally, let's get to the gene families. So on chromosome 17 is a gene that has a very high homology, so it's very similar to EGFR. So most likely this came about via gene duplication. And again, there's a whole uh, video on gene families. So this gene, um, it has a name called ERBB2. So there's a two in front of it. So that must mean that EGFR is the no number one. So actually EGFR is known as ERBB1. This other gene is known as ERBB2, right? And it produces a protein that is similar, but not identical to the EGFR protein, right? Um, now I draw it a little differently because when this gene evolved, right? So it duplicated, it mutated, and it integrated itself into the growth and differentiation of, of organisms. This gene evolved to such a mechanism that it lacks a region that most of the, of the family members have. So if you look at my drawing, what did I leave out of the drawing? What was that? What's that domain called? That is the ligand binding domain. Now it seems very strange to have a growth factor receptor that can't bind growth factor. And that's exactly what ERBB2 is. It is a member of this family. It has a tyrosine kinase domain. It has tyrosines in it that can get phosphorylated. We're gonna see it can participate in dimerization and transphosphorylation, but it has evolved away its ligand binding domain. It doesn't require it for functioning. And we're gonna see that in, uh, in the next video on how this uh, protein functions, but it is a member of the EGFR family. It is similar to all the other EGFRs that we're about to see. So, but clearly missing a very important part, but that's okay, because it still functions in certain ways. There's another gene on chromosome 12, which has homology to EGFR gene and the ERBB2 gene. That gene is named ERBB3. So it makes a protein, we can call that protein ERBB3. Now you'll notice I drew a little differently than the other two. What did I leave out? So what I'm drawing in purple, I, the, what's that domain in purple? Is the tyrosine kinase domain. Now I've drawn it, I didn't, I left it out. Why did I leave it out? Because ERBB3, that version, that gene, um, has evolved away its kinase domain. Doesn't function as a kinase. Now that's very strange. How did it do that? Well, gene duplication, right? Millions of years of evolution where this gene uh, mutated and evolved away its tyrosine kinase domain. Well, is it a receptor tyrosine kinase? Well, it's a receptor and it's in the EGFR family, which is a family of receptor tyrosine kinases, but it's kind of missing a really important part. But you know what? It's gonna participate in dimerization and transphosphorylation, we will see how in the next video. On chromosome number two, there's another gene which has high homology to all these other genes and produces a protein very similar in structure to all of these other proteins. And that protein is called ERBB4. And that actually does contain a ligand binding domain and a tyrosine kinase domain. So all four of these genes, right, code for proteins that look very similar. There are differences between them, but uh, these genes are members of what we call the, the EGFR family. Right? Um, now, 
it's very strange to call this the EGFR family because most of those genes aren't called EGFR2, 3, and 4. You would think that would be the name for them. They're not. They're called ERBB1, 2, 3, and 4. So some scientists actually use this name for the family. They call it the ERBB family. And they'll call it ERBB1, ERBB2, ERBB3, and ERBB4. So why am I telling you this? Am I trying to confuse you? No. When you read papers, when you read scientific journals, you're going to see multiple names. You're going to see slashes between names. It's like, what, what are those? They're the, they're the names for the same thing. So the EGFR family and the ERBB family, same thing. So some scientists actually write EGFR slash ERBB family because both names have been in the literature long enough that both names stick. And so we tend to use both names. Another group of scientists discover these genes, call them something different. And again, they name it, they publish in it, and then they realize, oh, we're all working on the same thing. But that other set of names uh, is in the literature long enough that we have to keep them around because it's published under those names. So there's actually a third name for this family of genes, and that is called the Her family of genes. Um, again, where do these names come from? What do they stand for? Uh, you could get, you can go down a huge rabbit hole to find out the origins of all these names, um, but we're not going to talk about it in this video. But I do want to introduce this other set of names for all of these genes and proteins, HER1, HER2, HER3, and HER4. So in previous videos and in papers, when you read about EGFR, the other name for EGFR is HER1. So it's just a member of the HER family. It's the first member, so it's called HER1. Why does EGFR have to have all these names? Again, it goes back to scientists discovering these genes, publishing under a certain name for that gene, and then realizing, oh, we're all talking about the same thing, but the name still sticks. So I mentioned the HER name because uh, in uh, cancer research, HER2 comes up a lot. And so what is HER2? HER2 is the same thing as ERBB2. They're the exact same thing, just two different names for it. And that is a member of this whole family of receptor tyrosine kinases, even though some don't act as receptors and some don't act as tyrosine kinases. They're part of this large family. So uh, I do this to not to confuse you, but to educate you, because when you're reading research articles, you're going to see all these different names. And it's like, what, why are there all these names? All these names just refer to the same exact thing. Um, here is an example of a great website um, called Gene Cards. And you can go there and look up any gene and learn about the gene and the protein and the versions and the functions. Um, and so if you look up EGFR, which we covered in previous videos, Epidermal Growth Factor Receptor, you can find it there, right? And it's a receptor tyrosine kinase. That's exactly what it does. But you'll see that uh, the, one of the first things when you, at the top of the page, are all the names for the thing you just searched for. Because most genes have multiple names. And EGFR, same thing. EGFR, and if you look there, it says aliases. Those names that I told you, ERBB1, HER1, and EGFR are the most common names for EGFR. There are many other names. We're not going to go through the list, but there are a lot of names for EGFR. I'm not telling you this to confuse you. I'm telling this just to educate you because you're going to read papers and it's going to say EGFR slash ERBB1. It's like, well, what's, the, what's that mean? Same protein, two different names. ERBB2, which we just covered, same member of the family, right? Um, if you search uh, on the Gene Cards website, ERBB2, right, it is a receptor tyrosine kinase 2, um, even though it doesn't bind ligand. Um, and if you look under aliases, HER2 is probably the most common name for this gene. And actually, NU, N-E-U, another very common name. Where did that come from? Doesn't matter, right? A group of scientists discovered it, they called it that, and now that name has hung around in the literature. And if you look at this... Uh, page here and you look at all the aliases, HER2 has been discovered many different times by many different scientists and they, a lot of them gave it their own names. So these names are found in the literature 
And um, I just present to you the most common names here so that when you're reading papers and you're uh, reading about human cancers and you come up, the name, come up with the name HER2, oh, I know what HER2 is. HER2 is the same thing as ERBB2, which is the same thing as uh, the member of the EGFR family. So it acts like a receptor tyrosine kinase, although it lacks the ligand binding part. We'll talk about that in a later video. So the point of all these videos here, or this video here, is to introduce you to the EGFR family. And we're going to see in the next video how uh, many of these family members, uh, how they work, how they function, and how they could be dysregulated in human cancer, and how they are targets for cancer therapies.